All right. For those of you uh, watching virtually, this is the bell ringer, Acts 6 today, uh, about how the apostles uh, gathered some help in serving the church. We're going to try to cover two lessons today. A quick review from last class. We talked about the papacy and the episcopacy and how their roles of the church in uniting the church. Uh, the Pope comes from the term Papa and is the Bishop of Rome who governs the church. The Pontiff is the bridge builder and the church serves this unity. For those of you watching digitally or um, remotely, you can just pause the screen and take your notes here because period three already has them. This Pope is commissioned uh, by Jesus who commissioned Peter and Peter passes it on. Those are the bell ringers from last class. Two of many Bible passages where Peter is selected by Jesus to lead the apostles and have a true authority in the church. The Pope is said to be infallible, meaning he is preserved from error when he speaks dogmatically, a.k.a. officially, on faith and morals. This hasn't happened since 1950 when Pius XII um, defined the Assumption of Mary as Catholic dogma. Uh, but there was also the... Second Vatican Council documents in the 60s. So that was the first half of Lesson 2 on the leadership in the church. Uh, we're going to finish Lesson 2 and start Lesson 3, talking about the bishops and the episcopacy. <laughs> Catholic doctrine expressed in the liturgy, the magisterium, and the constant practice of the church recognizes that there are two degrees of ministerial participation in the priesthood of Christ. There's a lot of big fancy words here. I'm going to break them down for you. Write them down if you need to, but I will. Um, what we're saying here is that and these two catechism paragraphs say the same thing. Bishops are fully and completely priests. Why? They have the fullness of ruling, of governing, of proclaiming the gospel, and of establishing the sacraments in their area. They are, they have that fullness because they have a greater authority. Okay? The priests that you know, Father Brian Taylor, Father Kyle White, Father whoever, they are simply extensions of the bishop. They are assigned by the bishop to go preach the gospel and serve the sacraments at whatever parish they are assigned to. Okay? So they are more extensions and therefore a lesser degree of the priesthood than the bishop. That's what this is saying. So the bishops have the fullness of the priesthood largely because they have a great, great authority and a great responsibility a great responsibility. They are responsible. Bishop Douglas Desitel is responsible for proclaiming the gospel throughout Acadiana. And every soul in Acadiana is uh, supposed to be guided and offered graces and revelation from God by the direction of, of the bishop. It is a massive task, you know. Almost a million souls, maybe, or uh, half a million souls, are under the uh, shepherding of the of the bishop. You know, that's a that's a lot. So we're going to talk about the role of the bishop. We've already talked a lot about how uh, they're appointed by the pope to govern a certain area. Um, this is not always the case, as we will see on the next slide. Okay. A little bit more here. These big fancy hats you see in the picture are called um, miters. They are basically um, just signs of authority, kind of like a crown, if you will. Um,
All right, so similar to our slide on the Pope, uh, we're going to break down the basics of what it means to be a bishop, how to make a bishop, you know, 101. You see the picture here. It might be a little bit small, but um, hopefully clear. Is a bishop putting his hands on somebody. It could be a deacon, a priest, or a bishop. But uh, as we read many times in Scripture, this is how people were appointed a bishop through the, as you had in your vocab quiz, laying on of hands. The catechism here describes it as the imposition of hands, the putting on hands on another man from a, from a bishop is how you make a bishop. So I'll read this with you. The apostles were endowed by Christ with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit coming upon them and by the imposition of hands. So, um, you know, from other, other priest bishops laying their hands on them. They passed on to their auxiliaries the gift of the Spirit, which is transmitted down to our day through Episcopal, a.k.a. bishopry, consecration. So uh, that's how uh, a priest becomes a bishop, from, from another bishop praying over him, prayers of consecration, passing down that spiritual authority from the apostles. And so locally, Bishop Douglas Desitel is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Because he has received that imposition of hands. He was a bishop in Houston uh, before he was assigned here to Lafayette. I, we, we've already largely talked about how Pope Francis is going to basically take candidates and then he, he uh, selects one to be bishop of a diocese. But it was different, kind of a fun fact here. In the early church, the local congregation would have to take a vote. It was a little bit more democratic. The early church would take a vote. Who is the best uh, man in the room to lead us spiritually? They take the vote, and so-and-so is selected. He'd then have to walk to another bishop to receive that blessing and authority, that consecration. So, um, so even though there's no pope involved in the early church, because communication was much harder in the early church, and Christianity was illegal, you had more involvement in the local community. Nevertheless, uh, one bishop would still be consecrated by another bishop, and so you see the church uh, with a structure and with unity. Remember the key part of this chapter, unity under her shepherds, under the bishops, under the pope, eventually, as today. They are appointed in such fashion. <clears throat> I want to uh, point out, I want to make this picture a little bit bigger here. Uh, this picture of a bishop here is holding the staff that you saw the bishop here at Turlings last week have. Um, and that is called a crozier. C-R-O-Z-I-E-R. -E if you can't read it, it's pretty small. Crozier. Crozier. C-R-O, like the crow. Zier is actually with a Z. Z-I-E-R. Crozier. And what does that look like to you? Yeah, yeah. Major hint with the shepherds underneath it, but it is a sign of his authority, of course, the authority over the flock of Christ. He's been assigned to guide y'all toward Jesus, and and some of you next year are going to have another encounter with him when you get uh, confirmed. He does half of the confirmations. He can't get to all of them in Lafayette, so. Half of you will be confirmed by the bishop. The other half will be confirmed by another Monsignor, probably, who's assigned to your confirmation. You got a, a, a church you know you're going to get confirmed at? Which one? Oh, Grand Cat St. Ignatius is the school. Okay. Cool. 
Um, so yeah, the bishop will have his crozier showing uh, his role as uh, shepherd of the flock of Christ. Oh, my clicker doesn't work now. Oh, and I said that, but I didn't pull it up. The Pope appoints bishops. All right, so let's talk about that's how to make a bishop. Now we're going to talk about that shepherding role uh, of what the bishop actually does. Episcopal consecration confers, together with the office of sanctifying, also the offices of teaching and ruling. So, as I already referenced, the bishop has the job of proclaiming the gospel, teaching, and governing. You, priest, go here. I want a school to open up here. Uh, the rumor on the street is Bishop Desitel is trying to open a new Catholic grade school out in Youngsville because that Youngsville Broussard area is growing rapidly in population. So that's more and more Catholics. So we need, just like the Lafayette public system built Southside High recently, we need another Catholic school out there. And off the record, if we can get another high school out there, that would really hurt us, Dan. Um, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Not trying to do that. One church, right? One church. Uh, teaching and ruling. In fact, uh, the grace of the Holy Spirit is given and the sacred character is impressed so that bishops take the place of Christ himself. Teacher, shepherd, priest, act as his representative, there are good bishops and there are bad bishops. There are holy bishops and there are less than holy bishops. But all bishops sit in the seat of Christ, ruling, governing, guiding. And so whether the bishop is good or bad, you know, you, you deal with situations as they come about, but it's a position of respect, of honor and authority, you know. And uh, they, you know, they do have that role of, you know, maintaining that unity. And so it's important that we try to work with the bishop in all circumstances for his good and for the good of the local church, of course. Teaching, shepherding, priesting, and acting as uh, he acts as the representative of Christ. So that's why Mass truly was special last week at Turlings. Why? Because we had the one priest in his fullness, the bishop, <clears throat> who has all the authority to proclaim the gospel, and he was here with us directly, speaking to us, and I thought he gave a very good homily about um, you know, how he's helping a Holy Family School grow, the importance of Catholic education. He talked about the Eucharist and the Pope, um, you know, good, clear things that help that are all fostering unity with Christ and each other. So In the early church, uh, a bishop would write a letter when one member of his flock would move to another local church. And authenticate that the person was a true Christian. So this is another instance of, let's look at the church at another time and the role that the bishop would have. So-and-so Christian is going to go move somewhere else. Uh, the bishop would, would have the role of writing a letter, authenticating this person has received their sacraments, is a faithful Christian, Catholic, and that person would present it to the next bishop that they fall under. Once again, the bishops are the standard of unity um, for the people of God. All right. All 
All right, so th this lesson's a little bit shorter, but let's try to get a head start um, on it. Describing uh, moving down the hierarchy uh, from Pope to Bishop, down to the priest that they, of course, assign uh, throughout the diocese. The same way a bishop does it tells trying to unite all of us in the flock of Christ. So too, Father Brian Taylor, of course, has the job of keeping Turin's Catholic High School united. And his other, perhaps more prominent job is to keep all members of St. Genevieve Catholic Church united, uh, of course, in Christ and, and, and to each other. Okay. So this first um, first note I'm going to bring up is the definition of what it means to be a priest. Uh, the key word is is mediates. Let me try to get that pen out. The true priest is one who mediates, and I believe you know what that means, going in between two parties. So the, the priest, of course, goes to God and brings the graces of God to us. But every priest is defined by uh, their ability to, to mediate by means of sacrifice. So they got to sacrifice something uh, to, to reestablish our relationship with God. So what is the, um, I hope this is an easy question for you. So what is the one sacrifice that the priest offers so that you can be one with God? L louder, Mia. Oh, okay. So you're thinking of the personal sacrifice that the priest, that's a good guess. The priest sacrifices a family and marriage so that he can serve the church that's an image of his own personal sacrifice that can bring fruit uh, about in his ministry. But that's not it. Uh, any other ideas? The priest offers a sacrifice so that you can be one with God. The Eucharist. The Eucharist is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross offered to you today. So, um, yeah, there's no other sacrifice. Uh, we all make sacrifices, hopefully. If you live in a family, you sacrifice for your family. You sacrifice for your team. You sacrifice for your school community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those are all good. I'm going to get to those in about two bullet points. But the one true sacrifice that saves us and gets us to heaven is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And that's what the priest can offer you that nobody else can. And that's something that every priest can offer you. Now, the next three bullet points all say the same thing. All right, you've been taking a lot of notes today. You're hanging in there great. I'm very appreciative. I know. I know how we all feel right now. But 
you can limit your 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 node work by being reassured that the next three bullet points are all going to say the same thing. Why did I put them up there? Because I want you to see how clear uh, a vision the catechism puts out there for uh, what it means to be a priest. Okay? And that is to be a slave. A slave of Christ. And a servant of others. Priests are truly slaves of Christ in the image of him who freely took the form of a slave for us because the word and grace of which they are ministers are not their own but are given to them by Christ for the sake of others. They must freely become the slaves of all. The priests are ordained. Yes, they rule. Yes, they govern. Yes, they teach. Yes, they have authority. But Jesus told us that if you have authority, it's to serve other people. It's to make other people holier, to, to get other people to heaven. It's not for your own glory. It's not for your own satisfaction. We saw how maybe Pope Leo X had the wrong view of the priesthood and the papacy when he was voted pope, and he said, oh, that's party. You know, we, we saw that last chapter. Well, that's not what Jesus taught, and that's not what the priesthood is about. It's about service. The ministerial priesthood, those who are ministers serve those who are baptized priests. And this is going back to um, sacrifice. You know, you and I make sacrifices. You and I are priests. Do you mediate God's light to the world? Do you bring people closer to Jesus? Some of you are saying in your head, no. Uh, that's, that's, it's hard to do that in high school. Nevertheless, that's what you're called to do. And so that in the future, hopefully, we, we can get there if you're not there today. You are mediating the gospel. You are Jesus in the world. How are you Jesus in the world? By sacrificing. By laying down your life for others. By making the world a better place, etc. And there's, there's countless ways to do that. You are a priest. You're baptized a priest. And you were able to do that when you were baptized. You became Jesus Christ, the high priest. But all those sacrifices you and I make, they don't mean anything if, if we don't have Jesus' sacrifice. And so the, the, the ordained priests have to uh, sanctify our sacrifices through, um, through the Mass. Uh, but they have to serve us. They have to insert more grace into it. The exercise of this authority must therefore be measured against the model of Christ, who by love made himself the least and the servant of all. Once again, saying the same thing. The priests have to serve the community. A lot of the, why am I hammering this home? Why am I elucidating so much the same points of the catechism? Because uh, sometimes in your Cajun culture, priests can be very um, elevated. And the truth is, they are leaders. But sometimes it's like, oh, Father, so and so is so wonderful, and 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 everything the priest said is necessarily true. And sometimes it, it can uh, be taken the wrong way. Um, priests have to be on their knees, you know, washing the feet of other people. And sometimes we don't always get that, but that's why it exists. Um, uh, authority is service in, the eye, in a Christian life. The reason why I have this kind of weird picture where you have this super up-close uh, shot at a priest, what do we call this? <laughs> that is his neck. This is Adam's apple, right? Chin. What do we call this? <laughs> a collar. So if I ask you who wears a collar nowadays, it's kind of a weird question, but what would you say? Dogs. What? Dogs? Dogs wear collars. True. True. That's actually could be kind of in the direction I want to go, depending on how you, how you take it. 
today we talk about white collar, you know, your lawyers, your doctors. You got blue collar, you know. You got dog collars. Let's, let's stick with people for now. Rewind the clock a few hundred years ago when the Catholic priesthood started wearing these who wore collars back then, 300 years ago. Who said it? Alan? Slaves. And, and I think uh, some of you else were thinking. Slaves, collar around their neck with chains connecting their wrists, chain going to their ankles. Slaves wore collars and that's why priests started wearing a collar they're saying i'm a slave to the church but it's not like a bad slavery it's like a, i have given my life to a service so that the gospel may be proclaimed okay so it's uh, this collar is is should be a symbol of, of humility and a symbol of uh, putting god and the good of the church first um, so i want you to know that You got lunch. All right. <clears throat> okay, I'll tell you what. Um, Y'all did great today. I'm going to just pull up the slide on deacons uh, just for those digital. Oh, nope. There's more to talk about, but I really don't want to overwhelm you with more information today. I really don't. So we're going to pause it here. Those of you... Uh, Watching digitally, uh, we will pick it up from here next time.